uh, welcome everyone on the on the Zoom call tonight to the uh, 1,149th meeting of the New England Botanical Club uh, since its founding in 1896. Um, I am the, the current president of NEBC, uh, Jesse Bellmer. I'm a plant ecologist at Smith College. Um, this week um, in particular is a very uh, sort of momentous time for the New England Botanical Club because this past Friday, yesterday, um, marked the exact uh, 125th anniversary of the founding of New England Botanical Club um, on February 5th, 1896. Um, so it's uh, sort of an amazing time for NEBC. Uh, our organization has been um, clicking along for 125 years now. Um, and this, this year is a big year, big anniversary for the organization, 125 years. Um, I want to thank um, corresponding secretary, Nancy Eistersmith, who uh, emailed all uh, NEBC members yesterday with this announcement about the 125th anniversary and uh, shared a link to some really fascinating old pictures of the founding members of NEBC. Um, so if, if you haven't noticed that yet, take a look at that email. Um, you can check out some of the, the group of founding botanists um, who launched NEBC back in February of 1896. Um, we, we do look forward though to having a chance maybe later this year um, to meet in person again um, and sort of celebrate this, this anniversary a little bit more appropriately. Um, but for this evening, at least, we just wanted to uh, sort of raise a glass to uh, celebrate the 125th anniversary of NEBC. Um, a couple announcements before we get to tonight's speaker. Um, I just wanted to note that our next uh, regular uh, monthly meeting is on Saturday, March 6th. Um, at 7 p.m. with uh, Wesley Knapp, who uh, works for the North Carolina Natural History Program or Natural Heritage Program. Um, and he'll be speaking on extinct plants of North America uh, with a special focus on um, uh, plant species that have gone extinct in New England during the past two or 300 years. Um, he was the lead author on a paper recently about um, extinctions of plant species in North America since European colonization. Uh, it represents one of the best summaries of what we know about uh, the extinction of plants in North America uh, since that time. Um, so definitely mark your calendars for the first Saturday in, uh, in March uh, for the next regular NEBC meeting. Um, I also wanted to note that before our next regular meeting, we will be um, scheduling a special meeting uh, near the end of February, Saturday, February 27th at 7 p.m. Um, to address several business items for NEBC, um, including some updates to the bylaws of our organization. Um, these haven't been updated since the 100th anniversary in 1996. Um, so please stay tuned for, if you're an NEBC member, for some announcements about that uh, special meeting at the end of the month um, to tackle some NEBC business. Um, one other announcement, uh, the NEBC Research Grant Awards, um, the Graduate Student Research Award, Junior Faculty Award, and the uh, Mierhoff Research Awards. Um, the uh, application deadline for those programs this year has been extended uh, from February 1st to April 1st um, as in recognition of sort of the challenging circumstances that a lot of uh, researchers are facing with the sort of uncertainty about the summer and what uh, field season might look like or ability to access herbaria will look like. Um, so we've extended the deadlines for applications to those grant programs until April 1st. Um, so if you are or know anyone who would be interested in those programs, um, you haven't missed the deadline. The deadline has been shifted to April 1st this year. Um, and you can check out uh, more information on that uh, on the NEBC website. Um, so shifting gears to uh, introduce our, our speaker for this evening. Um, our speaker tonight is Dr. Mason Heberling, uh, who's joining us from Western Pennsylvania tonight, where he's the Assistant Curator of Botany uh, at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History in Pittsburgh. Uh, Dr. Heberling is a plant ecologist and botanist who received his PhD from Syracuse University uh, in uh, 2015. He has a, a really impressive record of uh, research publications on plant ecology, 
um, forest ecology, climate change and phenology, uh, invasion biology and global change. Uh, some really fascinating work over the last 10 years or so. Um, his research has appeared in the Proceeding of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, American Journal of Botany, Global Change Biology, uh, and the New Phytologist, uh, among other journals. Um, he's also a leading proponent of uh, sort of new approaches to using natural history collections, and in particular, herbarium specimens uh, for cutting edge scientific research. Um, and it's that work um, that he's uh, been a major proponent of over the last few years that really got us excited to, to invite him tonight and have him speak to uh, the NABC audience, um, given how closely many of us work with herbaria and the value we place on herbaria. Um, I think Dr. Uh, Haberling can really speak to the continued value of those collections and some of the unforeseen and really fascinating uses that these specimens can be put to um, in uh, modern approaches to ecological and biological research. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce um, Dr. Heberling. Um, as with our other uh, recent virtual meetings, um, all the, the audio and video is turned off for you uh, in the audience, um, but we'll invite everyone to uh, ask your questions um, towards the end or comments towards the end in the chat function down at the bottom center of the, the Zoom screen. Um, so you can type your comments, type your questions into the chat uh, function, and we will sort of compile those and organize them. And I will moderate a, a sort of a question and answer with Dr. Heverling at the end of the, the talk uh, tonight. Uh, so without further ado, um, I will hand over the sort of center stage here to Dr. Heverling, who will be uh, speaking to us about new uses of herbarium specimens. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Jesse. And of course, my dog literally just started barking. Isn't that great? Um, yes, thank you. And I'm glad I had my video off too, because that introduction was phenomenal. And I'm over here blushing. So that's a good, good thing my video was off. Let me um, share my screen. All right, I think I'm shared now. Let me um, go ahead. Yeah, so thanks so much, Jesse, um, and thanks a lot for tuning in. And I'm hoping you're hearing me now, because if you aren't, I'm guessing you'd let me know. <laughs> um, so it's a big, it's, it's a bit daunting, but it's quite an honor to talk to, uh, talk to the New England Botanical Club tonight. And special thanks to um, Jesse Belmere and the others at the Botanical Club for, um, it, for the invitation. Um, this is a really fun talk. I enjoy giving it, and every time it's a little bit different. Um, and so, but it's kind of along the theme of exactly how Jesse introduced kind of the importance of collections and kind of rethinking, um, so thinking about collections in general, but then also kind of rethinking um, um, get past, present, and future kind of perspectives on collections. All right. And so I'm a plant ecologist from, as a background, and, and I'm quite, um, I'm becoming more and more comfortable with the herbarium, but I, my background is not really in collections or in, um, in herbarium specimens. And I will have to admit that um, my whole, I really haven't, ha didn't touch an herbarium specimen um, until after my PhD. So it's always kind of a foreign thing. And so coming very much from outside of the museum world, it was always kind of quite striking to me. I kind of had this kind of perspective of collections being something that um, is for, um, taxonomists, so not ecologists, is kind of a, a place with dusty plants, so to speak. And I, um, I certainly was wrong about that um, impression, but that was my impression. And the one thing as an outsider to herbarium, herbarium collections is that collection methods haven't really changed very much. Um, so even at the, at the founding of the New England Botanical Club, botanists were collecting plants in a very similar manner than that, that, that they collect today. Um, there are, of course, some exceptions, um, but really not very many. Some exceptions um, being, you know, perhaps um, collecting tissues for um, DNA analysis, for instance, or frozen tissues. And then, of course, um, GPS, you know, to getting GPS coordinates with your collections. Um, but otherwise, the, the, the fundamental herbarium specimen really has not changed very much. And I wanted to um, point out the person here um, collecting this just to embarrass her because I know she's on the call. 
Um, Bonnie Isaac, my colleague, a bit of my, um, pretty much everything I've learned about Herbaria has been from her, the uh, collection manager at the Carnegie Museum. And so I like to think of Herbaria, which is the plural of Herbarium, um, kind of as open data, kind of before open data was really a thing. Um, so over the past 300 plus years, um, Herbaria have served many different scientific roles. Won't go into kind of the fascinating history today, but instead I want to focus on, on their use, on their past use, on their present use, and on their future use. Um, so there's an estimated um, more than 390 million plant specimens um, archived in more than 3,000 herbaria. And of course that number is growing and it should continue to grow. And I like to think of each specimen kind of having an important um, scientific, but also a cultural story to tell. And so just as one, one um, um, specimen story to kick off is um, this specimen here, which is the oldest specimen, um, at least to my knowledge, collected in Pittsburgh or in the Pittsburgh area, um, which is actually not at the Carnegie Museum Herbarium. And it's actually not in the United States, but instead at, at Royal Botanic Gardens Kew. Um, and so I kind of came across this and the kind of the fun story of this is kind of reading the Wildflowers of Western Pennsylvania book, there's, um, which is an out of print book. Um, there's a little paragraph kind of on the history of collecting at the region. And in there, in there is a little kind of da 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 da, you know, kind of thinking about when, when at least European botanists have, have been collecting and botanizing in um, North America and kind of the, the oldest collections um, and, and when these collections started. And there's this kind of little nod of like, oh, the oldest collection is at Kew. And of course this book was, um, um, you know, written decades ago. And I just was like, oh, I didn't realize that, um, you know, collected in, in the early 1800s, um, 1830s. And it's said it's at Kew. And then I just go online and type it up and bing, bang, boom, there it is. Um, so I think that also is kind of a kind of a testament to the, the current age of digitization and kind of that we have that we have this basically globally shared set of collections. Um, so whether it be at Harvard or at Carnegie Museum or at Kew, um, access is is um, is ever increasing. And the fun story of this too is that this um, particular species is kind of an interesting one to be the oldest collected um, in that there aren't very many records um, in the Pittsburgh area, or at least in Allegheny County where Pittsburgh is, um, which is which is also kind of interesting and perhaps um, also a testament to um, the importance of herbaria to kind of archive a, a baseline um, of botanical change. I've broken this talk up into kind of three different areas and, the, and just kind of under this broad theme of rethinking what is a specimen and, and what good is a specimen. So we'll first start thinking about, you know, why herbaria? Then I'll go into thinking about some emerging specimen uses, some unanticipated uses. And then um, I'd like to spend the most time in particular on thinking about kind of broad thinking on the future of collections and also on collecting. So first, why herbaria? Um, are they still relevant? Are they still necessary? So like I said, you know, my honest, um, not that I didn't have respect for herbaria, but I wasn't entirely, um, I was unaware of their relevance, I'll say, until, um, until later in, in my graduate school. Um, so, you know, thinking, you know, amid financial concerns, you know, collections cost money. Should we be having these collections? Um, so not only the collections themselves, the conservation and care of the collections, um, but just as important, the staff, the expertise, the curation, and the physical and now the digital infrastructure required behind there. So amid financial concerns, are collections worth it? Amid ethical concerns, should we keep collecting? Um, so there's kind of two questions here, you know, should we keep collecting um, to grow the collection or should we just keep what we have? Um, and so there's kind of this, um, what's now kind of a relatively famous sci uh, opinion piece that was in the journal Science from 2014 that kind of ruffled a lot of feathers, um, which kind of made the argument of perhaps specimen collecting, um, should be a last resort or not necessarily um, 
um, the mode of data collection. And so in, in this piece, they say, you know, alternative methods of identification should be used to avoid collection of voucher specimens of threatened or rediscovered species. And um, there was kind of a rebuttals and back, back and forth about this. Um, so the question, I mean, the question is a valid one though, among ethical concerns, um, should we be collecting? Um, so why collect from nature amid um, financial concerns, ethical concerns? Um, you know, why do we keep continuing to glue dead plants um, to paper? And so that's what I want to talk about a bit. Um, so I like to think of, um, so when I first came into an herbarium, I'm kind of like, you know, what are, what's, what's the purpose of these? What are these different uses? And I'm still learning different uses of collections. And it's, um, I'm just usually fascinated by how people interact with collections and how research, um, what research products come from collections. And so I, I kind of think of them in kind of these five non-mutually exclusive, um, so kind of non-overlap or these overlapping areas of, of what I'm calling expected uses of specimens, these core specimen uses. And those include taxonomy and systematics, kind of the bread and butter of, of um, not only herbaria or plant collections, but natural history collections, period. And this um, cool paper from 2011, I think, is, is still worth repeating that, um, you know, it's estimated that more than 50% of the undescribed um, plant species are actually sitting in herbaria right now. So it is a place of active um, plant discovery. Um, blah, blah, blah. Um, floristics and biogeography, um, so thinking about what is where and why. Species identification, so you know what is this and even in the age of smartphones and, and, um, and the internet and being able to look at you know high resolution pictures, um, there are a lot of cryptic species or different, um, there are cases where you really need to look under a scope or you need, need to need this physical voucher material um, for identification purposes. Um, which brings me to the next point is scientific vouchers. So that is um, science must be verifiable and repeat, repeatable and, and in biology and in plant biology in particular, um, kind of that fundamental datum, that fundamental um, um, voucher is indeed the physical specimen, the physical plant itself, um, such that in 10, 20, 100, or even a year from now, um, what I'm calling um, plant A, you know what I mean, um, as the science changes around it or mistakes are made. And then a final core reason um, is just um, merely education, you know, raising plant awareness and literacy and, and, and that, tangi that tangibility of the physical specimen is important. And so, um, so these are the prevailing uses or how I'm thinking of the prevailing expected uses of collections. Um, but I'm really interested in thinking about has herbarium use changed? Um, so have these core, core areas um, expanded um, beyond? And so to do this, um, I ask kind of three main questions. That is, you know, do herbaria remain relevant? Um, what are their major uses and have, have, the, have those uses themselves changed? And so to do that, I um, teamed up um, in this kind of big literature review um, of, of publications that have in some way used herbarium specimens um, with Steve Tonzer, who's um, at the Carnegie Museum and Alan Prather at Michigan State University. And so just to kind of throw the punchline out right away is that herbaria are relevant um, in modern research. So here we have a figure um, of, you know, about the last hundred years of publications, um, peer reviewed publications that use herbarium specimens shown in the dark black. So you see that there's this kind of exponential increase. Um, so not only are they remaining relevant, but they're increasing the number of um, studies that use herbarium specimens. But maybe that's not so surprising given that um, more publications in general are ha happening and more research in general. Um, so kind of as a bit of a control, you can see in the background is that in the gray, the gray triangles is the number of um, total publications in, in all of plant sciences. Um, so you'll see that um, in fact that um, that that rate of increase is that herbarium related research is is in fact keeping up with um, plant science research in general. So there's no difference in in, in that. Um, and so the herbaria remain relevant. 
And so in what areas though? Um, so over the past, um, so again, this was this this is results from a kind of a text analysis, a computational text analysis that I won't get too much into the details now. Um, but it's essentially looking at all of the titles and abstracts of more than 13,000 different studies and using um, um, word associations, um, being able to group these different papers into different um, topics. And so here there are um, 22 different topics in the herbarium related literature. And so what you'll see is um, just, I won't read through all 22 other topics. I'm sure some of them jump out at, at you and some may or may not be um, unexpected and some are more common than others, but there isn't really a particular topic that dominates. So for instance, taxonomy um, is, is a core area of herbarium use and has been over the last hundred years, but it's not necessarily a dominating one. Um, and the cool thing about this analysis as well is you can also look at these different connections between research areas. So um, in this analysis, it doesn't necessarily, each, each um, study does not necessarily need to be shoved into one topic, but instead can be related, um, can be um, essentially a proportion of multiple different topics. And so here I just grouped them into kind of um, these different colors um, are grouped um, into these broader topic areas, so kind of themes of topics. And um, here the size of the node or the size of the circle is proportioned proportional to the amount of literature in the past hundred years for that given topic. And that topics closer to each other and connected with a line are, um, are more common to co-occur together. Um, so for instance, there's kind of this clustering of um, taxonomic uses and a clustering of um, uses in floristics and of in particular in the black um, biodiversity and global change. And so that's all fine and cool. And I was really interested in kind of quantifying that or like um, kind of moving beyond speculation, but like actually looking at the literature and seeing how people are using these um, studies. Um, but what I was really interested in kind of the main uh, motivation behind this, this project was to look at um, the trends in herbarium use. So that is how have these different uses changed through time? And so um, again, you don't need to like go too cross-eyed looking at every different line here, um, but each line is a different topic in, in, the, in the literature, in the herbarium-based literature. And so you can see that some, um, some topics go up, some topics go down, some go up and then go down. Um, but really the big take home, however, is um, that there's this, um, there may be certain dominance in certain decades of, of particular topics, but in, in overall, there's kind of this um, diversification of specimen use. So you'll see, you know, 100 years ago, there were a few dominating topics, um, in particular kind of um, taxonomic notes in history and in, in, in that general area of, of um, herbarium specimen use. And then over the last 100 years, there's been this diversification from a few topics to many. Um, many different research areas. And then another kind of key take home is that no topics really um, were um, um, extirpated or, or no topics um, completely went away, but instead there was just um, a diversification of many different topics. And so that kind of shows that there are these kind of emerging roles, emerging perspectives um, in, herbari in the herbarium-based research and the herbarium-based community in general. Um, so traditional uses have, have expanded, um, notably with technology and, and various um, methodological developments. Um, and then new uses have emerged altogether. Um, and some of that is not only because of um, new technology, but also because of um, new perspectives or new users of herbarium data or herbarium specimens. Um, so, for instance, in taxonomy and systematics, um, which is still kind of the cornerstone of collections, um, some topics go up and down, but in particular, um, like DNA analyses, for instance, um, is a use of specimens that, of course, the collector 100 years ago wasn't, um, wasn't necessarily envisioning, and certainly curators of, um, of herbaria were not, um, did not have that use in mind. Um, so that's the case of um, a kind of technology enabling um, 
asking of new questions and a long-standing theme. And then there's also um, other areas that have essentially emerged from nothing a um, hundred years ago, and that is areas of biodiversity and global change. And in particular, um, so thinking about different, um, you know, plants uh, distributions changing as a result of climate change, for instance. So kind of to wrap up this section, um, thinking about, you know, why herbaria, um, hopefully I made the case that herbaria are relevant. They're still, um, they, they are by no, it is no means a dusty space, but a very active space. Um, but the roles are changing. Um, so, and in, in, in particular, um, the uses are expanding. So we have these long standing uses um, that remain kind of the core foundation of, of why we collect and why we have collections. Um, but those uses themselves are, are expanding into new, new areas. And so I wanted to just talk, talk next, kind of narrow in on, on some of these um, emerging specimen uses. Um, so thinking about, you know, how is specimen use different today than it was 100 years ago? And so um, for this, I'll kind of, I guess, um, uh, selfishly uh, take some highlights from my own work. Um, but I will say there's many exciting, um, there's so much exciting research happening in herbarium um, specimens and collections broadly um, happening in many research groups across the country and globe. And so, like I said, you know, specimens are now serving many uses um, in which they were not originally intended. So when I first started, um, at a museum, you know, as a postdoc, my, de my desk was in the herbarium, and I would often hear um, Bonnie Isaac, the collection manager, kind of giving tours of the collection. And I was always struck, kind of, you know, I, I also would listen in um, just as any, any visitor to the herbarium um, would. And I was always struck that kind of many of the uses of collections, um, at least that are given um, public facing, um, to kind of validate the use. I was kind of struck that many of the uses are in fact um, not the uses that necessarily were the main collection uses 100 years ago. And so that kind of sparked me uh, um, to end various conversations with Bonnie to think about these unanticipated specimen uses. And so we just went through um, one, one journal, one botanical journal, looking at the number of papers that used specimens. Um, so here, the number of papers that use specimens published in the American Journal of Botany, looking at two different areas, um, functional traits, um, so extracting trait information from, from um, the specimens themselves, and then also DNA. And you can see that there's really just in the last 20 years, really, there's kind of been quite literally like a, a, an emergence um, from almost nothing. And so as a plant ecologist, and in particular, um, a, a functional trait, um, my research resolves, revolves around functional traits, um, it kind of became apparent that herbaria are these rich sources of functional trait data. So not only, um, you know, across species, so with, you know, hundreds, hundreds, thousands of species, but also within species, um, across space and across the environment and across, um, in particular, across time. And so from an herbarium specimen, what can we measure? Um, of course, every herbarium specimen is unique and has every species has its own, um, own uh, strength, so to speak, for um, extracting data from. Um, but some traits that um, I'm thinking about are, you know, plant height, um, various leaf traits like leaf area, leaf mass per area, um, metrics of leaf shape and leaf chemistry, um, and then seed mass, flower and flower and fruit shape morphometrics and then of course phenology and phenology has got got a lot of attention in particular um, looking at the herbarium record for changes in um, flowering time for instance or leaf out time or, or fruiting time um, but the question is again since these these uses weren't really intended um, the collector didn't envision that you that that um, a, a user of, of this specimen would would do um, would make these measurements on. Um, the question is, you know, are herbarium traits reliable? And so most most of these functional trait protocols um, are generally require fresh tissue, and an herbarium specimen is not fresh tissue. Um, so there really are um, 
some questions relating to, you know, what, what information can we get reliably out of a specimen? And so um, Tim Perez, who is a, um, is a postdoc at, at University of um, British Columbia, but at the time of this study um, is a graduate student at the um, University of Miami, um, kind of was asking this very question. And so we kind of teamed up to kind of think about um, essentially what can you measure functional traits from herbarium specimens. And uh, so here we have um, a comparison of, of one very commonly measured trait, um, specific leaf area. So that is um, the um, area per mass of, of, the, of, of a leaf, which is correlated to many different um, aspects of, of plant, um, plant function and plant growth. Um, and so um, what he found was, um, was that SLA from specimens is in fact highly correlated to fresh measurements. And that these patterns actually even hold within species. So it's not necessarily just a, um, a species specific, you know, at the resolution of a species, but intra specific um, traits hold as well. And also measured um, in the middle there, which I didn't remark there, is um, leaf thickness. And then also measured branch specific gravity. And so kind of the take home from this study is that um, herbaria are indeed untapped kind of big data source for functional traits. Um, and so right now I'm working on this big review to kind of think about um, kind of the quite literally hundreds of studies that have used, um, have measured plant traits in various ways, um, but the many, many thousands of, of additional um, studies that kind of are just waiting to be done in herbaria. And so, um, here on the left is the, um, the, the landing web page for the TRI plant trait database, which is this big um, compilation, this big repository of different plant traits. And you'll see that there's um, you know, over 11, almost 12 million trait records um, available in this database. But interestingly enough, um, at least at the time of this, um, I believe that that's, this is changing through time, but about zero of those um, or close to it are, were actually measured from herbarium specimens. So herbarium specimens are kind of this um, kind of unrealized um, big data source for functional traits. Um, and so just looking at kind of doing a comparison with TRI, so this big trait database that's, that's not herbarium based, and these records are, are mostly by plant ecologists or plant ecophysiologists or um, plant biologists in the field. And so on the left, this is just the total number of records in TRI. You'll see that there's 11 million. And then just, these are just the herbarium specimens that are digitally available in, in um, GBIF or, or the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. So this is not all of the specimens, but the ones that are available on GBIF alone. Um, and you'll see that there are quite a few, um, even if we could extract one trait from each specimen, this would be a huge um, kind of boon, a huge, um, um, a huge data source to, to grow our, our global understanding of um, plant function. And this, of course, is true across species too. So here I just pull from the from this tri trait database, um, three commonly measured traits that could be that, you know, have been shown and have been measured from specimens. So that is specifically varia and mass, which is um, leaf nitrogen um, on a mass basis, and leaf area. So all three of those could be measured from an herbarium specimen. So if an herbarium specimen has a leaf, those traits could be measured. And so just looking at the number of species, so not the number of specimens, but the number of species, um, you'll see that herbarium specimens, there are orders of magnitude more specimens, um, more species represented in specimens. Um, so again, this would include, this would kind of increase our um, taxonomic scope of, of our understanding of, of plant traits and plant function. And then also within species. Um, so here I'm just showing the observations per species. So kind of as a comparison with the tri trait database, um, um, these box plots, you can look at the um, kind of the median is, is, the, is the, um, the thick black line. And you'll see that kind of, uh, uh, in the tri-trait database in terms of replication within a species. So to look at intraspecific 
variation or um, variation within a species. Um, each species represented in tri, although there are certainly outliers, but kind of um, the average observation number of observation per species is far, far lower um, than the average number of um, specimens represented per species. Um, and here again, just kind of using GBIF as, as one, um, one metric of comparison, which is this um, database, the searchable database of these herbarium specimens that have that are digitally accessible. So herbarian traits is something that I've become um, a bit obsessed with and thinking about in particular as my background also in um, invasive species. And so thinking about um, do species traits change through the course of invasion? So kind of using this information that we can measure traits from specimens um, to kind of look at um, not only when um, in, in introduced, species were introduced into a new range, but also how have they changed? So as they invade perhaps new habitats or, um, uh, or potentially evolve. And so here's just one example I'm kind of just highlighting, um, mostly because I'm also still actively um, working on this, so this isn't necessarily the final thing. Um, but I've been looking at um, many species in southwestern Pennsylvania, and in particular one that's um, at least worth sharing right now and is, is um, also of special research interest to me is um, invasive knotweed. So here we have Japanese knotweed on the left. On the far right, we have giant knotweed. And in the middle, we have their hybrid bohemian knotweed. And I think at least some of these taxa are, are in New England um, at, at, at some um, dominance. And um, here in Pittsburgh, we're kind of a, 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 a melting pot of, of knotweed. There's quite a bit of knotweed along um, Pennsylvania, um, Pittsburgh's three rivers here. And so this is just looking at herbarium specimens in the Carnegie Museum herbarium, just looking at leaf area, not looking at um, other traits. Um, so just leaf area. And you'll see that in um, Japanese knotweed that there's kind of, there's pretty convincing evidence that there's been an increase in leaf size. And so kind of the reasoning behind this, I'm still following up on and I'm still looking at, um, of course, connecting um, climate information with each of these points as well. Um, and, and we have some field work also um, measuring the differences between these taxa and, and potential um, reasonings for um, different functionality of, of different leaf areas. This is kind of just some tantalizing evidence um, looking at one invader of what we could look at many in this specimen record. And so not only are specimens um, kind of more a uh, good source for morphological or chemical trait data, but definitely phenological data. And phenological data, um, that is the timing of, of various events like flowering, leaf out, and fruiting, has um, been a, a super active research um, area of research in, in the herbarium world. Um, perhaps one of the most active areas and, and the uh, da, 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 da. And so um, we are using herbarium specimens in, um, tying with other field work as well, um, thinking about um, asking about the effect of climate change on our spring wildflowers in particular. And so this was a fun project. Um, which is still ongoing, um, which I was fortunate enough to team up with Henry David Thoreau, Richard Primick, and um, Caitlin McDonough McKenzie, um, New England Botanical Club Zone, Caitlin, um, to ask some of these questions, um, along with Jason Fridley and Susan Kalis. And we are now continuing this work also with my um, colleague across the street, Sarah Kibbing. And so what we found is, um, so this is not using herbarium specimens, but using um, the journal of Henry David Thoreau is, um, and um, contemporary measurements from the Primick lab, is essentially we found that trees are more responsive to climate than wildflowers. So as the climate, as the springs get warmer, um, both trees and wildflowers are leafing out earlier, but I'm gonna kind of gloss over this, we have, um, for the sake of time, um, but uh, trees are advancing at a much faster rate. So trees are um, in, in the Boston area about um, almost two, almost leafing out almost two weeks earlier since Thoreau's time. 
um, whereas wildflowers are only leafing out about six days or, or a week earlier. And so that means that this kind of window, this early window of opportunity for our spring ephemerals, in particular our spring blooming wildflowers that, that get a lot of their light in the early spring, um, that this window of early light before being shaded out from the trees is becoming narrower and narrower. And as part of this paper in Ecology Letters, um, um, we also combine this, um, this kind of historical phenological um, data from Boston. We combine that with um, some ecophysiological measurements um, on photosynthetic rate and, and um, essentially plant growth um, here in Pittsburgh. And we were able to kind of relate, um, kind of forecast um, and hindcast um, kind of the impact of this. And we're also following up on this with um, field measurements as well and artificial shading um, experiments. Um, and in addition to the field work, this is the main reason I was introducing this, is um, we're also using um, herbarium specimens to kind of look at this pattern, this phenological mismatch of the overstory and understory across um, a, a, a big latitudinal gradient, so across the eastern U.S. And um, herbarium specimens provide, um, so Henry David Thoreau's journals were obviously fantastic and, and perfect for this, um, but is isolated to the Boston area. But we have herbarium specimens all across the Eastern North America and across the world um, to, to look at the same questions as many of these specimens were collected either in flower um, and in the case of trees that flower at the time of, um, in the early spring, um, it also captures leaf out. And so, um, PhD candidate Tara Miller in, in um, Richard's lab at Boston University is looking at, um, is using herbarium specimens in this way. And so just some preliminary evidence is that um, she certainly has found some um, pretty interesting differences um, that this pattern holds that, that was found in Boston. Um, but it's, it is um, potentially different um, at different areas along the Eastern US. And so we're following up on this. I mean, basically um, all of this is, is relatively pre preliminary, um, but we're following up on this, looking at um, Eastern North America, um, all across Eastern North America, and then also looking at Europe and Asia. So similar floras, um, similar, similar temperate floras to see um, kind of how widespread, how globally widespread, and what these different biogeographic patterns um, might represent. And specimens are also genetic data. Um, um, and so as, as I was working on um, in actually the uh, invasion project, I noticed that a lot of herbarium specimens have roots and not many people have, um, it's kind of like, geez, not only do they have roots, but there's dirt adhered to the roots. What are the, you know, what can we do with this? So kind of as an outsider, I was like really kind of interested in, er, in herbarium specimen roots. And so I just called up um, a, a colleague of mine, um, David Burke, who's a micro microbial ecologist at the Holden Arboretum and was like, hey, um, do you think you could like do, it was really kind of an open-ended question. Like, do you think you can measure um, anything from an herbarium specimen root. And so kind of one thing led to another. Um, and we were um, able to measure, da, 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 every time I hit the button, it does something different. There we go. Um, mycorrhizal fungi on um, these um, um, spring wild, they're all spring wildflower um, roots. And so more than three quarters of, of our forest plants rely on these, this um, symbiotic relationship with the mycorrhizal fungi. Um, and so we just we just did a kind of a preliminary sample um, just from the Carnegie Museum herbarium alone, looking at um, you know two common species of trillium, um, false Solomon seal, and Jack in the pulpit. Extracting um, essentially sampling roots off of um, herbarium specimens and doing kind of this similar workup that um, my microbial ecologist friend um, David Burke does um, in the field, but with herbarium specimens. And there we go. 
And the, the punchline is, yes, you can. So um, we were able to extract um, mycorrhizal DNA from um, over 135 plus years of, of um, fungal communities. And um, of course, not all were successful, but quite a few were and enough to um, make some really interesting insights. And so we'd like to follow up on this. This was kind of a proof of concept type of thing, um, but we were able to basically um, basically match results that that um, that David had found in the field. That is that certain mycorrhizal communities are more closely associated with particular species, um, host plant species than others. So that kind of validated that we indeed were extracting um, the relevant mycorrhizal communities um, from at least these four species. And so um, that's pretty cool. So specimen uses are changing. Those are just a couple of um, a, cap, a couple of um, examples of um, kind of innovative specimen uses, of which there are many, and I'm reading about many more, um, quite literally, like every month. And so the question is, you know, if specimen uses are changing, should we be changing? And so that's the kind of the, the main purpose of this talk, and kind of what I, what I really get excited about is thinking about the future of um, collections and collecting. Hence, kind of the, the title of, of rethinking the specimens. Um, so here, you know, as um, museums now not only you know, curate the physical specimen, but also um, digital data. And so in, in, in addition to um, the specimen itself, um, we're getting high resolution images from the data from um, of the specimens, um, putting them online. So they're um, becoming more and more um, accessible by researchers across the country, across the globe. And we really are kind of at the cusp of what we're calling kind of digitization 2.0. So, um, you know, not only um, this digitization kind of happening at the level of the Natural History Museum or at the level of the herbarium um, within, but also kind of this distributed network of many, many different collections also doing the same thing and digitizing um, and exchanging information and sharing. And then also, um, this digitization is now, we are now having kind of derived products from the digitization. So for instance, measuring leaf areas from specimen images, for instance, um, is one example thereof. And so um, not only that, but then also, um, so not only is it kind of enabling old, these old uses, um, or rather making the old uses more efficient, but also enabling new uses altogether. And so, um, machine learning is another kind of hot area of herbarium specimen use now. Um, in other words, kind of artificial intelligence. And so I was able to be a um, part of this cool project, um, basically kind of looking at um, the, the use of machine learning to be able to, to uh, advance phenological research. So just like I showed that we have, um, you know, these millions and millions of um, specimens across the world, um, many, many of them are becoming imaged and um, basically using computers to be able to do phenological scoring at various levels um, and, and various resol resolutions, kind of these big data sources to look at um, phenological, um, phenological change, um, both across space, across time. And kind of the next range, the, kind of the, this next frontier of specimen use also is, is um, which kind of goes hand in hand with digitization is this idea of the extended specimen. So the specimen, we have the physical specimen itself, but then we have the kind of this constellation um, of different data streams, either extracted from the specimen itself, whether it be trait or, trait or DNA information, or from complementary um, data sources like historical um, climate information, for instance, or um, et cetera, et cetera. So we kind of have this, the specimen itself and then this constellation of many different um, data streams. And so a big part of that is kind of integrating all of these different data streams. And so I kind of already mentioned um, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility or GBIF before um, as you know, one platform, um, one portal 
um, of integrating um, collections um, data kind of together. Um, but not only does it include collections data, but it also includes other sources of data as well, including um, citizen science or community science observations like from iNaturalist or eBird, for instance. Um, so such that you can kind of go on this um, platform and just search um, either by specimens or just in general. And um, so I was able to, um, wish you had these at 9 a.m. I'd be less, uh, less jibbery. Um, so um, the cool thing also about GBIF is that they track um, all of these different data sets that are available on GBIF. They're able to track um, data downloads and people are able to cite um, data from um, that they have um, downloaded from GBIF. And so um, it's not a complete listing, but of that GBIF is aware of, um, they've been able to attribute um, over 5,000 um, peer reviewed publications using um, data mediated on GBIF. So just for instance, as one example is um, the Q um, Botanical Garden, um, Royal Botanical Garden Q's herbarium um, has enabled um, 435 um, publications just from GBIF alone um, over the last decade, which is quite impressive. And so not only that, but then it's also, it's a mechanism to be able to um, essentially link research, um, link data sets back to the collection, but also back to the individual specimens. And so they do that by um, uh, being able to cite a DOI or a digital object identifier um, in the research. Um, and this also goes back to the data um, kind of um, data verifiability or open data, um, such that the raw data um, is linked with the paper. And, and you can go back to the, um, in the case of um, the herbarium, go back to the physical specimen. And so then the number of records on GBIF, so herbarium specimens or not, have been increasing um, hugely kind of over the last 20 years um, since its founding. And so here in the, in the black, you see the, the total number of biodiversity records available on GBIF. In the um, longer dashed, you'll see the observation base. And then kind of on, 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 the, um, on the lower bit there, the specimen base, kind of the dots, the gray dots. And so all, all um, both observation and specimen-based um, um, observations have increased, um, but they really have kind of been, um, the specimens have kind of been overshadowed in some ways, or at least how it's shown here by the observations, um, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but so not only do we have um, a rapid, rapidly increasing, the data is becoming more available, but the data is actually being more used as well. Um, so just again, in the last decade, there's been this kind of explosion of um, research using GBIF. And I will note the interesting thing here um, for this group too, is you'll see in the, um, in the proportional breakdowns of the different taxonomic groups. Um, so in the left, those kind of the, the donut pie charts, you'll see that plants account for 19% um, of the records in GBIF. But if you look on the right, um, plants account for 44% of the um, of the studies. So I find that to be an, an interesting thing. And so having the data open and available also um, enables, not only enables data use, but it enables global data use. So from researchers all across the, the world, so they wouldn't have to come to the Carnegie Museum or, or um, but, but have access. And so um, in the, so basically just looking at the map here, each dot is centered on um, countries of the world, and the size of the dot, of the beige dot, is um, proportional to the amount of um, research publications using GBIF um, in that country or, or by authors in that country. Um, but if you look at the color, so either the orange or teal around that beige circle, you can kind of see if there are more researches happening by researchers inside the country than expected about research in that country or vice versa. And so it, this basically the take home is, it's a little bit confusing, but the take home is that um, GBIF data 
and, and these data platforms are enabling kind of um, a broader and more diverse research across the world. Um, but there still are some legacies of, of um, kind of colonialism in certain areas are, um, the biodiversity of certain areas are certainly more studied um, by foreign researchers than domestic researchers, which is interesting. I'm gonna just keep going here. Um, and so this here um, is a map of science. So it's a, it's a big network of all of the, um, essentially all of the um, journals that are indexed in the web of science, which is a major, um, which indexes almost all of the major peer reviewed journals in science. And the different colors um, are showing, so um, the different colors are showing the different areas of research or the different topics that these journals have clustered into. And then these, the circles themselves are showing the GBIF data. Um, they're the, the, the GBIF publications using um, GBIF data. Um, so you can see like there's many, many green circles um, kind of down there. And so 79% of the um, GBIF mediated publications fall into journal areas relating to biology, which is maybe not that surprising, right? But what is surprising is that there are quite a few, um, certainly, not a majority, but um, there are quite a few other research areas that are enabled by open biodiversity data. And so that this, this data use kind of crosses these disciplinary boundaries. And part of that, um, and part of this kind of goes to the question of, you know, kind of thinking about collections versus um, non-collections data and integrating the two. And so as I showed before, you know, there was, there's a, kind of the, this huge surge in the number of observation based data. So data that doesn't have a specimen associated with it. Um, many of which are through platforms like iNaturalist or various community science or citizen science projects. And it kind of makes you think like, are these specimens or are these the new specimens of, um, of this century? And I'll argue that, um, different data streams kind of have different, um, different uses and different values. And um, nature is more than fits on an herbarium sheet. So we really do need to rethink how we collect. And now that we have new ways of collecting data, so both physical and um, digital um, observational data, um, and kind of these different complementary um, data streams. And every time I click the button, I feel like I'm talking to myself now, but anyway, every time I click the button, it makes a really weird noise. There we go. Um, so what we did, and this was in, in collaboration with Bonnie, um, Bonnie yet again, is um, kind of this really cool idea of basically thinking of iNaturalist and using iNaturalist as a uh, collector's app to kind of enhance our, our collections. And so we go out in the field, um, we take an iNaturalist um, specimen, so to speak, take a picture, upload it to iNaturalist, and then you're able to associate that image um, and the data associated with it with the physical specimen that you would collect. And so I like to think of, um, you know, each different data stream kind of having um, a different uses. Um, can't get DNA out of an image, for instance, but sometimes you can't get um, perhaps the color or other, um, other traits out of a, um, a, a specimen or the, 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 the uh, a press specimen. It just isn't the same as a picture in some ways. So some examples might be, you know, the modeling of the leaf or how the, how the flower is um, declined or not, or how the, um, or the, the community around um, and its habitat where it's growing, um, the color of its pollen, the population, different characteristics of the population um, and, and associated species, for instance. And so iNaturalist kind of has, has, has kind of a neat kind of little mini museum kind of atmosphere uh, kind of built into it. It's kind of been in some ways kind of independent to um, collections. 
And so there is, you know, a, a users, a, um, a community of citizen scientists that will, um, you know, help identify the, um, your picture or your specimen. Um, when you take the picture, you get the geolocation. So if you're using your, uh, a smartphone, for instance, um, you're automatically capturing, you know, the GPS information. Um, the associated records around that spot, um, phonology, other, um, you can set up different projects. Um, there's kind of like a huge amount of different uses. And so the way, way um, that we're linking iNaturalist is through this, um, which you probably saw on the label before, is just simply through a QR code that redirects, the, um, redirects you to the iNaturalist observation of that given um, specimen. So I envision, um, we envision kind of a future where you could have like a, you know, a, the user of the herbarium can just be kind of have an iPad, for instance, and you're looking at an herbarium specimen, and then you can um, kind of just put the iPhone or put your um, iPad camera up to the, the label, be redirected to the iNaturalist observation. Um, so you're looking at the physical specimen, and then you're also looking at the pictures um, that that collector took or any notes that that collector may have had. Um, and then you can also look at other people's identifications, for instance. Um, so basically just simply linking iNaturalist with specimens um, kind of has, has huge power and huge promise. And so we wrote this up um, kind of as a, as, a, um, as a protocol in the applications in plant sciences um, a few years ago, if you'd like to, like to check that out. Right. Um, I will say there's nothing like giving a talk on a Saturday evening um, to yourself, but you know that 50 people are, are listening. It's great. <laughs> um, so there are these shifts towards um, new uses, and not only are they new uses, um, but many of these uses are opportunistic or unanticipated. And so that leads to different biases. So temporal biases, biases through time, um, biases across space particular taxa might have um, particular biases associated with them, phylogenetic bias um, you know, are we collecting um, certain groups of plants more than other groups of plants, um, and specimen age bias. So in the case of the, of the root work, you know, is the, are certain um, mycorrhizal associates, certain fungi not as well preserved in a hundred year old specimen as it is in a five um, year old specimen, for instance. And so it really comes down to the question, you know, is the specimen representative of the population? And so all of these uses um, are no longer necessarily these, those origi original five core uses that I kind of um, opened up with. We still have those uses, but we have many other uses of specimens. And it really comes down to now thinking of um, kind of either correcting for or accounting for bias in the past, and then also thinking about how we collect um, in the future, um, such that we, we are collecting specimens that are um, representative of population or representative of the community's needs or uses for the collection. And so these new uses, um, I'd argue kind of require a new curation. So we have this rising demand for destructive sampling, for instance, um, should we be archiving speci in specific ways for DNA in particular um, and morphometrics? Um, some other big changes that I think could happen are like standardizing labels and metadata. I mean, right now there's really, um, sure there are kind of, there's a standard kind of taxonomy or a standard uh, group of fields that are associated with an herbarium um, specimen record. Um, but what goes in those fields is not necessarily all that standardized. So for instance, the habitat is, is one, one main one. Um, you can pretty much write whatever you want in there. And of course it's useful, um, but it could be more useful if we're able to standardize um, uh, the basis of the information with newly collected specimens. Um, embracing new specimen types, so this idea of, you know, extended specimen, and so that may include, you know, taking iNaturalist specimens or iNaturalist observations with a specimen um, and taking additional iNaturalist observations or additional pictures, photographs, notes, etc., cetera, um, that go with the specimen that may not be about the specimen itself, but about um, associated species, um, the community, et cetera. Um, 
collect across different taxonomic groups, this idea of holistic sampling. Um, so not just plants, but maybe they're um, associated pollinators, for instance. Um, and then establish intentional long range plans for collecting. So we should continue um, general collecting that is kind of um, collecting, so to speak, without a particular purpose in mind or um, with simply the idea of capturing the, um, the biodiversity of a given area. Um, but also maybe an intentional plan of, of revisiting the same site um, over and over, for instance, like a, having a having kind of a stratified plan um, such that we're documenting um, biodiversity and, and just as important biodiversity change. There we go. I was getting that spinning wheel. Um, and so this is a um, part of a project um, that we're doing at the Carnegie Museum Herbarium um, is going back to um, sites with historic collections and going back to either the same day or as close as we can the same day, um, you know, 100 years later, for instance, um, to be able to capture this change and going the same day to even be able to capture phenological change or, or to be able to do these um, kind of direct comparisons. And so this here um, shown here is from a, an exhibition at the museum, We Are Nature, um, which had a really cool, um, it was, um, you know, about humans and living in the Anthropocene and uh, global change essentially. And there was a cool wall with um, herbarium specimens kind of showing these kind of before after pictures um, that were kind of kind of visceral, tangible, um, visible examples of um, changing phenology from year to year and in particular long-term changes in phenology that may otherwise not be overlooked or easily overlooked or not quite known. Um, and visitors really engaged with that. And so one example, you know, just one example, kind of cherry picking one example, um, but an example nonetheless, you know, is, is blood root um, sanguinaria canadensis, um, you know, collected over a hundred years um, apart in the same location, same date and a very different phenology. And so these kind of displays like this, again, goes back to one of these historical uses that is education, but, um, you know, visitors are able to respond or the public can respond to um, seeing, kind of tangibly seeing the specimen and seeing these, um, this, this change being documented. And then of course, we can document this change then in, in many different ways and replicate it across um, through time. Um, so even though this, this, um, this exhibit, you know, kind of just kind of cherry pick some examples um, we have this replicated many, many times to look at that pattern um, more rigorously or more statistically to kind of look at the effect of climate change, um, not just between these two years, but between many years over the long term. So, okay, good. Um, so I, I just want to finish off this talk of, of hopefully I've convinced you in my, um, with my dog barking and my um, evening kind of um, um, meandering mind um, that we must keep curating specimens. So we must keep what we have. And then it's, ex it's an exciting time for collections and, and they're needed um, now more than ever. So we must keep curating. I think we must keep collecting as well. It's sometimes easy to think, um, or there's this kind of general notion that collection, the act of collecting or plant collecting was something that was done a hundred years ago. And we're so grateful that those botanists did that. Um, but we no longer really need to grow the collection or we only need to grow the collection um, in, in certain areas, not necessarily in, in, um, to document all uh, diversity. Um, but I'd argue and I hope that, that, um, that I made the case that we must con keep continuing collect to collect. And then um, uh, just, honestly, just as important, I think we need to rethink you know, how we are doing both of those things um, and how we are collecting. And with that, I will um, take a deep breath and thank um, all of my collaborators and um, everybody involved with this. And, and thanks for tuning in. And yay. <laughs> and I think, um, do I need to do something special? Let's see. I think you can stop your okay. screen. Stop my share. OK. Oh, well, well, thank you, Mason. That was a, a fascinating talk and just um, really inspiring and, and just sort of this 
the picture you've you've painted of sort of how vibrant these collections are and how much potential they have going into the future. I think that's a really reassuring message to a lot of botanists who may have come through the 1980s and felt like herbaria were falling by the wayside a little bit. Um, right. And so these these new ways of approaching the collections and the the values that you're you're presenting about them um, is just really fascinating. Um, so I would. We'll open up the chat now. Um, people can post messages there. I will try to uh, field those and uh, relay them along to to Mason. Um, I there's a couple of questions that came in over the course of the the presentation. Um, early on, Russ had asked about um, this potential lag between herbaria collections and the pace of global change. Um, and he was sort of referring directly to you know a lot of range maps for species are based on herbarium data, mm -hmm. but some of those collections may be from 50 years ago or 100 years ago, and the distribution of a species is sort of this static thing based on 100 years of specimens when the range may actually be shifting quite quickly. And sort of how do we cope with that or keep up with that to um, keep that type of biodiversity data current and reflecting the dynamic nature of species ranges now? Yeah, I, I mean, that's a tough one. I mean, I think it's it, it's related to like um, species distribution modeling too. You know, if you throw in all of these um, collection records, um, what the environment was a hundred years ago may have not been what it is now. So there's like, it's, it, it is um, confusing. So I think the, I think, um, I think it's really important when they, when, when you see maps of, um, even just like state level records, you know, and you see records that are um, basically shown of like, has there been a record? Is there an, is there a record in the last 20 years for that county? So I think that's one way of being um, at least um, knowing if that plant or having some understanding if that species is likely to be there or not, um, assuming collection collections have happened. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's kind of a tough thing. I mean, I think, um, especially the, I mean, I guess species ranges in general are just very dynamic um, in general. So I would probably, basically the, the edge of a range is probably always um, up for debate probably, but I don't, I don't know. I'm sorry if I'm rambling. I don't know, was that the question? <laughs> yeah. I think uh, many of us probably also appreciated your emphasis on the, the value of collecting and continuing to collect here and now in that you know, many people's research programs have benefited from these historical collections that, you know, this work that people did 80 years ago, 100 years ago, documenting many, you know, areas in great detail. And now we're sort of tapping those resources. Um, but to some extent, the, the rate of collecting today has fallen behind that historic rate, such that botanists 50 years ago, 50 years from now or 100 years from now, you know, we're living through this very dynamic period in time, and it would be great to have a lot of data on what plants are doing right here and now, where they're moving, and yet the rate of collection is, is quite low compared to what it might have been in the early 20th century or the late 19th century. Um, so I think that what you presented there was really, really good. Um, there was a question a couple minutes ago from Karen about um, just the potential concern about the, the longevity of the digital data compared to that physical specimen that, you know, even if it's neglected, it will still be there 100 years from now or 200 years from now in a cabinet, mm -hmm. you know, will that QR code still link to something 100 years from now? Um, yeah. will that di digital data actually have a shorter lifespan than the physical specimen? I mean, that's a, that's a really great question and like a really interesting one. Um, I mean, just in the, just as a slight analogy, I mean, because we're thinking about this now that we are, and I'm guessing, you know, that's happening. I mean, certainly it's happened at Harvard as well as this, these digitization projects. And the biggest thing is like, now we're having to digitize, um, or now we're having to have the digital ex expert, expertise and the digital infrastructure to maintain that and to archive that. Um, and it actually is pretty hard. <laughs> it's not like that easy. Um, and I'm sure we all know, like we've taken tons of plant pictures, I'm sure everybody, and you may or may not actually um, be able to find that picture again <laughs> later um, type of thing. Um, but anyway, just as an analogy though, is I, I have heard that like, for instance, like the, 
the old movie films, like the actual tapes themselves or film strips are actually like easier to, to curate um, or at least have a, have a lower cost associated with them. And you basically can throw them in an environment as long as they're in the right environment, they're good. Whereas exactly with the, with the, when they're digitized though, um, it actually requires like more effort and more continual effort um, to keep it up. So yeah, it certainly is. I mean, and then in cases of like with the iNaturalist, for instance, um, yeah, we basically just need to really, um, museums are now digital archives too, whether we um, have fully accepted that or not, and we, we need to be. Um, yeah, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we had, uh, Melanie uh, had two questions sort of coming off of your, your presentation. Uh, mm -hmm. One of them was pretty specific to the, the Japanese knotweed example that was really, oh, okay. yeah. really interesting. Um, she was sort of wondering about potential artifacts there of, you know, is there something going on with the, the amount of time that the colony was establishing and growing that early, you know, early specimens would be from an, you know, a, a colony that was just establishing. Uh, and also just this broader issue that, you know, many collectors are somewhat biased in the specimen they're going to collect from hmm. a plant or a population and you know may have avoided the 90 percent of the plants that were eaten up by beetles or caterpillars and found sure. one or two that were more pristine and, and is you know those types of artifacts or biases in the collections in the past yeah no that well the the knotweed specific suggestion is an interesting one not one i really had thought about actually so i'm happy she said that just thinking about i don't really know if if um stand size correlates to individual um individual you know uh ramet traits so that's kind of an interesting thing to think about i think um, I guess I will say the, the current conceptual direction that I'm thinking or the hypothetical direction is it has to do with this hybridization, um, yeah. introgression, genetic um, stuff is happening um, that's changing morphology and potentially um, different habitat affinities. That's why we're doing some field stuff related to that. Um, but that is a valid point. And that's, um, so that's why it's like, we wanna, uh, yeah, um, the, the notion of, of um, biases in herbaria are, are interesting. It seems like um, we're very, I guess I will say that not many people seem to, um, there certainly are biases, but it's, it's interesting that they're, the herbarium community though gets a lot, or the herbarium specimen gets a lot of skepticism, whereas leaf area would also be measured by a plant ecologist in potentially the same way and people don't really say anything about it. So it is interesting, but I'm just, yeah. it, it is interesting. I mean, there's some actually really some cool old papers. I'm currently writing this big paper on um, this big review of, of use of traits. Um, and there's um, some really cool things in the literature of, of people saying about how, oh, I don't know why people don't think that think that herbarium specimens are biased, and uh, it, it really is like a point of contention. Um, but the 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 herbivory one, I think, is um, like there are certain traits that I think are more biased or more like more susceptible to bias, and it depends on the species too. So I think leaf area could be biased, for instance, if it if um, the collector if the if half the leaves could fit on the sheet and half couldn't for that species, for instance, and that might be something, or for plant height, one that can fit on there. So there are like a lot of different kinds of psychological things. I think the biggest thing though, in the case of herbarium specimen biases though, are would you expect that difference to be, um, to change through time? So like, would you expect that for some reason collectors now are less likely to collect in the case of the herbivore um, or in the herbivory damage, you know, or, or is there a reason to suspect that collections in 1990 collectors were more or less likely to collect damaged specimens than they were in the 1910s? In the case of that, that may be the case, but uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Luckily, I don't do that, but Emily Meineke has, has, oh, yeah. does a lot of this, um, and I, I, I could have easily featured the talk on, on her work too, looking at herb herbivory, and I, um, I think she's done a great job um, advocating for the use of, of specimens in that way, but it's also a, a challenging one because there's all these biases. Yeah. One, one other question that Melanie had asked, um, you know, the, the connections with iNaturalists um, sound, you know, really fascinating, really promising. Um, 
but there's in this audience here, there's a lot of people that work in plant conservation, the state mm -hmm. boss, uh, conservation agencies. And to what extent does, do those, those platforms potentially create, you know, a roadmap for uh, plant theft and collection, uh, um, you know, by publicly uh, distributing data on unusual plants yeah. or rare plants. Yeah, well, you can redact, or you can redact your own. You can make base not make it public. Yeah. Is one thing. The other thing is, um, it's actually it's um, I know, at least for Pennsylvania. I mean, it's pretty good. Um, the natural hair. I, basically, there's a list of species that are considered um, of concern in Pennsylvania, and they're automatically um, uh, the locality is automatically redacted when you upload it. So only you can see it, and then you can grant like the state. Um, or these botanists, for instance, to be able to see. So just like herbarium specimens are redacted, mm -hmm. um, have localities redacted, the same thing happens in iNaturalist. And you also have the, um, the choice, if you want to, to redact dandelion in your backyard, if you want to. You know? so, um, so there is a mechanism there. But that is a, that is an, that is a, um, a valid concern. But it's really the same concern with herbarium specimens going online, too, that, that that needs to be addressed and, and is addressed, I think, for the most part. But yeah, yeah. We also had a, a comment from Matt about um, uh, iPhone apps that are um, call notes, um, basically a way to collect yeah data in a digital platform, sort of immediately mm -hmm. in the field, and link it up with um, sort of expected data to go into a database and it, if you have any sort of comments on that or record yeah actually i i neglected now that i'm thinking about it too in my saturday evening ramblings here <laughs> i neglected to mention that we use iNaturalist also as a way to um you type in the data and you it actually um you can export and um export it into a, a label so a way to make your label easily um so it's all in iNaturalist and then it exports and is a pretty label for you um and that's kind of what the, the that collector app is too and i think there's a couple others too that are um i haven't used that one and and um but i've heard good things about it and i think that that is um i think that there are probably parts of that app in particular that are better than iNaturalist so iNaturalist we definitely are kind of like have hijacked it it's kind of a um a hack of sorts <laughs> so it's still kind of clunky and you need to like type in everything like i think the call notes for instance it can it can um auto auto fill you know everything that you are doing has the same locality you know and and it can sequentially increase your collector number stuff like that which is awesome and so i and there's some working groups now that are like i think um hoping to kind of integrate some of the pros of like call notes with iNaturalist and, and make it work the best way. I mean, the biggest pro to um, iNaturalist though is that you have the iNaturalist um, images that are connected to um, the specimen and the idea, I guess the hope is that iNaturalist would never go under, so to speak, that yeah. you would always have access to, the, to that link, um, but you could always archive your, your things too. But the biggest thing is the is basically having an image and not having the local herbarium to have to um, hold that that image or sets of images in their own database. Um, yeah. So yeah. Anyway, but yeah. So uh, one other uh, question here from Jim. He had asked about sort of in related to your concepts about sort of the extended specimen, new uses of uh, of specimens whether there may be um, sort of increased value in collecting sets of specimens uh, for species. If you're thinking about variation between individuals within a species, you know, rather than just getting that one specimen um, or, you know, a duplicate, actually trying to sample a population and creating yes. a number of, of specimens. That's a great, that's a great idea. That's a, I mean, I, I mean, obviously there's the, 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 the flip is there's already some collections that are that are already like not really wanting to take new collections. So to be like, I want to collect everything and, and here it is. Um, so that's the only issue. But yeah, and so actually this is part of this, this is one of the recommendations I'm making in this in this review actually is that I really think that, that would that's I think where we need to head for functional traits um, and intra-specific traits to be accurately um, 
recorded in the in the record is to basically collect what are called population samples or oh god it's late i can't even um <laughs> anyway the, so there was a paper in science actually in um like 1935 <laughs> that suggested to do these um to do this um oh then some other guy called it population samples i'm um I'm totally blanking right now um, what it's called, but it is it what it is. Um, it was um, Anderson and um, Turig. So it was to collect um, to um, purposely collect for intra or intra specific population level variation. And the idea is, and I think it's a really great idea. And I called a bunch of herbaria, and I've never actually seen one of these specimens, but supposedly these big names did this, but I'm thinking they were thrown out probably. But it is one, per, one, you take one normal herbarium specimen, just like so you have the specimen, but then you also collect, um, the example here was in, in maple, you collect three leaves, um, I think you collect three leaves per tree, and it, there's, they'll, there's like basically a method to, to, um, to, to do this, and then you put it all in, um, you have you store them unmounted, so they're not on on an herbarium specimen sheet glued to it, um, but they're separated in a palm folder. So then each um, each population would have its own palm folder essentially with an herbarium specimen and um, individual leaves that are loose leaf in there. So you can see why this would maybe be a headache for a curator, <laughs> um, but um, but I think it has huge huge value. Um, for sure, to to have a systematic way to be like, this is the variation at this site. Yeah. So we also had a, a a comment from Lisa here about sort of distinguishing some of these apps um, for data collection versus ID. And there's you know there's obviously a lot of general interest, public interest in you know an app on your phone that can identify plant species and you know. What, where do you sort of draw the line between those types of apps for identifying plants versus the uh, data collection uh, feeding into the types of activities you're thinking? Yeah, about. like into GBIF and stuff. Yeah. I mean, I don't think they're really, I don't know. I mean, I think, so in general, I will say, maybe I'm speaking for other people, but I think that there is some level of skepticism towards iNaturalist, towards things like this, because it is, um, Fundamentally, iNaturalist, it was designed and still is designed as a, um, for engagement, for engagement and you know, people excited about nature. It's not really meant for data collection, but that's, it worked out that way, <laughs> that type of thing. And so, but still iNaturalist, that is, I mean, the, the founders of iNaturalist, that still is kind of their main goal is to get people engaged with nature. Um, and so there is some level of skepticism regarding data quality, essentially, like, is that, um, is that good data? And so iNaturalist has kind of done a, a I think, an, a, at least a way to do that with what they call, you know, the research grade observations where you at least have another person, um, or you at least have a consensus among two, um, with at least two people on the, the identification of that. But however, of course, that's not really like perfect. Um, so there is that. I mean, I think iNaturalist is good too because it does have, um, it, it has um, an image. And if the image is not identifiable, if it's blurry, if it's bad, the hope is that the, that um, it wouldn't become uh, research grade or could be um, downgraded from, from that. Um, so I don't really think, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm being too like liberal with it, but I kind of think in some cases more data is better, um, but then there is the line of is more bad data better and sometimes more okay data is better. Like, I don't know, it's just very, it is kind of a, it's a tough, it's, it's, it is kind of a tough thing, but I kind of don't think that there, um, I don't think there's much of a line between um, the, I, I guess the, I think if the if the app is simply designed for identification and identification only, and people are just using it just for the computer vision, then yeah, that's problematic because then that person is uploading the, what they are calling a species, but
but they don't actually, they didn't actually have an opinion on it. It was just, and that's a problem in iNaturalist is some people just like clicking on the top suggestion without like um, any um, verification um, in any way. So yeah, it's kind of tough. I don't, so basically my answer was a non-answer, but I kind of lean towards, I think it's a good thing, you yeah. know? So um, I think a lot of people were, you know, really interested and impressed with the work you were describing, um, sampling soil off of the roots mm. of these older herbarium specimens. Um, Russ was saying, you know, sh going forward, should we be, you know, collecting specimens that have dirtier roots and intentionally mm -hmm. doing that? Um, and that, I mean, for me also, that raises the question of whether you should be, you know, archiving along with the specimen sort of a soil sample. Yep, and I've yep, yep. recently talked with someone who um, is exploring the possibility of sort of resurrecting microbes from old herbarium specimens and bringing them into experimental uses to compare yeah. how mutualistic microbes from 50 yeah. years ago compared to those associated with the species today and mm -hmm. similar uses of, you know, drawing seeds from herbaria to compare populations from 50 years ago to those that exist today to sort of track evolution potentially. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that idea of, you know, almost building in experimental material into some of these collections, like yeah. seed, yeah. seed material or soil material that can be drawn out for experimental uses um, and planning ahead for that. Yeah, I mean, I think absolutely. I think there's right for a, like a, um, uh, definitely a working group of bringing in a bunch of different people that are not from collect uh, both people in collections and not from collections um, like soil scientists for instance and like thinking like what when you go out in the field like what do you wish that someone collected a hundred years ago with that specimen yeah. um, and 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 what would you ask them to collect if they had a week to do it or if they had a, a five minutes to do it because there definitely is like you can't have every there just isn't enough um people are time limited so if if you're asking them to collect a ton of stuff then yeah. they may not collect anything so that's something to consider um but yeah absolutely i mean there's i keep hearing too i mean i'm not much of a um a dna guy <laughs> but of uh, that line of work but I mean, we're now saying, I mean, a lot of people are sampling um just like leaf material for instance for dna work um what if um, we simply, um, you know, one one idea I heard is, you know, maybe it should be standard protocol that every that you also collect a leaf in silica, and it is stored with every specimen. Um, that would be something that would be relatively um, relatively low investment, not a big ask, or even just to have a leaf that's put in a fragment envelope to start with. So when when people mount specimens, there's usually more material that ends up on that ends up that some material ends up in the trash inevitably. And so if there would be a way to, to, to keep that, so then that there is like every, every, um, every specimen that we collect now has a set of um, at least some material that if somebody wanted to pull from it, they could. Um, and then, yeah, the soil would be awesome too. I mean, just all of these things and or like, well, should, I mean, maybe even just the protocols themselves should be revisited because a lot of it's the Wild West anyway. Everybody has a different kind of um, training or thoughts on what, how they should do it. I mean, in general, I believe you really don't want dirt on the roots in yeah. this specimen is the, is the thought, you know, or like that is actually your protocol is like clean off the roots. Um, so should we be revisiting that in some way and, and having people not do that? Um, and just similar things like that. I think there's a ton of things that we need to think about um, and we need to, basically like gather all the current uses or the frontier uses and and ask what what we should do for in, for the future yeah great well thank thank you very much i think we've just about gotten to the bottom of the, the cool here um there's one last question from roberta about the redaction of rare plant data and whether this uh, defeats the some of the purpose of digitization um mm -hmm. Uh, so the possibility of showing county level data, um, but not publishing the image or maybe. Yeah, that's, that's how, yeah, that actually is how it's done right now. Yeah. Generally. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the idea that it's not, it, it's not fully redacted, like, oh, this is a secret um, yeah. specimen or a secret observation, but it's 
redacted to the point of you know that that this plant is found in that county but you don't know the exact um, locality and if you need to know the locality for a certain reason um, like a, to be able to actually revisit that site then you can ask the um, ask the the um, the herbarium or the people yeah yeah right well thank you very much this I mean fascinating talk really uh, you know reinvigorating for thinking about um, these collections and and where they're going um, so you know thank you for cool. taking your Saturday evening yeah. and, uh, thank you sorry about my dog I don't even know if you heard him but it was uh, <laughs> just faintly in the background yeah no and I'm like is somebody anyway it's all good yes thank you um, yes. this was great it was an honor so great. I appreciate it Yes. Well, thank you for coming out. You know, fascinating work and just this, the mission you have here of, of promoting these collections and, and spreading sort of the appreciation of them is, is great above and beyond the work you're doing as well. Um, so, thanks. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody.